Hello there. This is Being God's Obedient Servant channel. And in today's lesson, we're doing Psalms uh, chapter 50 through 52. And I'm going to go ahead and get uh, one part in this. I went ahead and reloaded 47 from last time, where we have this part in verse 2 where it says, the, For the Lord Most High is terrible. And I counted it as a possible mistranslation, but I wanted to look it up for old, old English. And it was not mistranslated. We just use the word differently today. Um, the word terrible in old, old English, say 1590, also meant to be uh, with profound respect and full of awe. So today we would use the word awesome. The Lord Most High is awesome. And But the word terrible at one time meant full of awe or awesome. So when things were given the names like Ivan the Terrible, uh, <laughs> It could have meant uh, profound respect, Ivan, you know, the terrible, you know, something with profound respect or full of awe. I don't know for certain about that area with that, but I said I did do some research and looked up and yeah. So it was not mistranslated for on, in the King James with that, but... <laughs> In today's language, it's something different. And it shows you how language changes over time. And this is why when you read something written in an old style, you have to learn the old way of speaking to make sure you don't miss it. Now, of course, I know it would be easier today to have the part where it says, Oh, the Lord Most High is awesome. But we miss that part where it says profoundly respectful. And to me, that puts a whole lot more meaning into that word. You know, it's not just saying, well, awesome. Okay, okay, something's awesome. Because we use awesome differently than what it would mean in this time as well. In many senses, we do. But yeah, I just wanted to put that out there real quickly. So for those that are kind of loyal and following a lot and stuff, you know, it was not a mistranslation. There's a lot of studies about the people that translated the Bible to the King James Bible. Because I think first it was translated into German and then from there into English of the time. And supposedly, from me hearing about it, they had like 50 different translators. And they all translated it differently. They didn't sit in a room and compare notes. They all did it differently. And then they compared afterwards. And they were all translating the same way. So... The one part about the word unicorn, though, kind of throws me. And it makes me think, was there actually a horse at one time with a horn on its head that we know nothing about? I don't know. And there's lots of things that went extinct over the years, over the decades and centuries. So, who knows? Maybe it was hunted into oblivion by some Asian people thinking the horn grinded down into a powder was an aphrodisiac, you know, something of that nature, and boom, they killed them all. I have no clue. Um, unicorn also could be a, a rhinoceros, a creature with a horn on its, on its head. They may have called that a unicorn at one time. 
Don't really know. As I said, because this word here, the way it's used in here, dates back to the 1590s. 1590s. That's a long time ago. But lots of things have changed in our world and have gotten so much better in our world since the Bible was translated to uh, English or, you know, a language to common language so all can read it and understand instead of uh, being lied to by or possibly lied to by priests and stuff that knew Hebrew and Greek and stuff and was reading from scrolls. But anyways, I just wanted to point that out before we continued on with anything else. So, to my normal introduction, if you are new to this channel and just clicked on this, uh, if you go back to the lesson before this, you'll see where I read this part, you know, read through already chapter 47 and where we where I already talked about this, but still, I do recommend if you don't know the Bible much, starting in Genesis chapter 1 and getting caught up, ignore my parts about some of the rules for the Sabbath. Uh, we are to keep it holy, but we're no longer under the rules that you can't work or travel or anything like that because that part is part of the law. And so the rules for the Sabbath have changed greatly. And it's still in the Ten Commandments to keep it holy, but the Sabbath also is still is Saturday. But yeah, I used to. Uh, the law was from even to evening, from evening to evening. So from Friday night to Saturday night, I didn't do anything. I was trying to keep the Sabbath, but I was keeping the Sabbath law, not the commandment of the Sabbath, which is keep it holy which most of us fail anyways, keeping the Sabbath holy. But we're to keep, we're to keep every day holy now because we're under grace. And so I don't know what we would do differently on Saturday that we're not supposed to do differently, you know, Sunday through Friday. You know, if anyone else has an answer out there on that, <laughs> you know, share it in comments. Do some research on that and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so ignore that part. Because uh, I'll say it again just real quickly for anybody new clicking on this. There's five parts of the Bible that no longer stand. This is the five parts of the law, circumcision, dietary, uh, blood sacrifices to cover sins and being stoned to death for sinning, and the laws of the Sabbath. So, but yeah, the Israelite law is the thing that was changed between Old Testament and New Testament, but the commandments and statutes, not the law, but the commandments and statutes still stand. And there's going to be some parts in here that uh, in this lesson that we're going to be getting to, as I said, starting off with chapter 50 here. Uh, it's got some good stuff to go through. Definitely uh, worth listening to. And it's uh, something that I've always tried to teach people that you have to watch out for. Because God says it in 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 a short summary of it, you're guilty of every sin you do, every sin you support, and every sin you help create. So, if you support abortions, you're guilty of murdering babies. So, because you support it. You don't have to actually do it or have had one done, you're still guilty of it. If you work in the facility, knowing what's going on, you're guilty. Whether you're the one actually in the OR or anything else. Like that poor girl in that movie, well, the story Unplanned, if you haven't seen it, 
I highly recommend watching it. She was unknowingly partaking in killing babies. She didn't know any better, though. She did not know what was going on. She was misled. Then when she found out what was going on, she now is against abortions because she was just told it was, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember how she said it in the interview. But she was misled into believing that it was actual, like, you know, sex education or, you know, was it? It was, she wasn't for the abortions, but it was to help prevent abortions. It's kind of how she was told that it was to there to educate women on more and stuff to actually prevent abortions or to you know, prevent stuff like that. But either way, she was manipulated and, dece and deceived into supporting something that then when she found out the truth, she went, you know, full-heartedly, totally against it. Because, you know, when you're deceived, it's not really held against you. It's when you know the truth and then you still do something, then it's held against you. As the Bible teaches, you're guilty of what you know. Unlike how the law is, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's uh, in many states they support that. That if you break one of their laws, that is not a common law. Like Jersey will, New Jersey, they'll arrest you and throw you in prison for having a firearm, even though you may have drove from one state where it's constitutional carry, legal to carry this, that, and the other, and you drove and crossed a bridge. And you didn't know that even having a firearm is almost a felony in those states. They will still arrest you in charge of the felony saying that, you know, well, you're ignorant of the law is no excuse. New York will do it and stuff like that. You know, these deep blue areas that are very corrupt. And there's even a psalm for them in here today. Yeah. It's got some good stuff in here. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right on in here. I'm going to try to keep this time down to around 30 minutes. I'm already past 11 minutes, somewhere in there. Let me check. Over 12 minutes. So, let's go ahead and get started here. Chapter 50, verse 1. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very uh, tempestuous round about him. Now, I had to look up that word. But yeah, it kind of means something like strong and turbulent. So it says, you know, so and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. So you be very turbulent uh, stuff like that it's like yeah no, no. they used to speak so much more sophisticated in common language versus we shorten everything the day and like now you got people they want to do uh, abbreviations even while speaking because they don't know how to say the word or what it means any other way it's uh, horrible really um, but yeah, it's, uh, in some ways our language is declining, but it does, like they say, the language evolves, changes a lot, depending upon generation to generations, like the English language when Jesus walked the earth didn't even exist. The English language was a combination of other languages coming together because some words we use are still in Latin. Some words we use, uh, kaput, that's a German word. And, you know, takes from multiple languages come and then they just started blending and people got used to saying certain things, blah, 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 is that and the other. And then it all of a sudden had another language. And... The English language is quite powerful because it's 
it's one of the rare languages. I think it may be the only language on earth today that you can use to talk without using your hands to describe things. It's a, you know, very informative and everything else in the language, you know, that you can just describe everything and no one really needs to see your hands or body movement or your eye rolls or whatever else. But many other languages, it does require that because they have one word meaning multiple different things and it all depends upon certain other aspects to know what you mean. But yeah. Anyways, let's continue on. Verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. Now we've got to pay close attention. God is judge himself. He is the, the, uh, oh darn, the word that's normally used for, you know, he's, he's a, the, the main just judge. The final judge, the judge above all judges, and it's very crucial. So anybody out there that's in law enforcement or part of the judicial system, uh, especially politicians, ooh yeah, you, you, you all need a lot of work. You know, God says if you put yourself in these positions, which you know politicians are kind of over judges but equal at the same time because judges are voted in. Sometimes they're appointed and politicians are voted in, but they're all under the constitutional oath. And of course, a, we go to judges to have things judged upon. But if you are not a just judge and judge justly, God says that's a very horrible sin to do that. Just like if you're in law enforcement and you know that you're enforcing an unconstitutional law like here in America, you're violating your constitutional oath. It's a big no-no. God said he holds everybody to any and all oaths that they make. And of course we know from God's word that as long as that oath does not violate God's word, he holds you to it. And the constitution is comes from God. You know, the rights of the Constitution actually come from God, other than the forced taxation, you know, the Bill of Rights, the amendments and stuff of that. Well, the Bill of Rights are, you know, that, that's what comes from that, but it's the amendments, was it the, I think it's the 16th Amendment, one of those, is the forced taxation that everyone's against, but the politicians done it anyways. Yeah, that one, no. But, anyways, let's continue on. Verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. Now, of course, this is King David saying what God would be saying. I will not reprove thee from thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings, to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, for nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon, the th upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, God saith, What hast thou to do, uh, let me repeat that. What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? 
Now remember, it's like we're commanded to keep the uh, sta uh, c we are commanded to keep his commandments and statutes. So, and declaring the statutes is as I said, it's all all the Bible reinforces everything of itself, what God expects from us. So, let's continue on here. Seeing thou hatest instruction, and casteth my words behind thee. Now, of course, he's still speaking of wicked people. Like, you know, lying, deceitful, manipulative people and stuff. Wicked people, they do evil and everything else. They hate God's word. They hate instructions. You've seen it getting more and more with these hateful people. They're wanting to remove the Bible from everything. And ain't just that. Now, they want to remove God's people. They want to remove the Israelites. They want to remove the Christians. You know, they're just full of hate towards anything godly. Uh, verse 18. When thou sawest a thief, then thou uh, consentest with him and hast been partaker with adulterers. And here's that one crucial part where I said, it's like, you know, of course you can kind of make out what the uh, con consentest with him means, that you consent so when thou sawest a thief, you consent with him. That you know, people always try to justify criminals. Politicians do this a lot today. Entire judicial systems in blue states in America are doing this very thing. Not just not just in America. Uh, England started doing this, and uh, Australia started doing it. You know, many other countries are now starting to do this thing where this is wicked in the eyes of God to do this stuff. You're trying to justify a thief. A wicked person saying, oh, well, it's not their fault, blah, 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 you know, da, 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 da. You know, that makes you guilty of their sins. All right here it says, and that, that, from that you are now been partakers with adulterers. That, you know, you may have not committed adultery, but since you support it, you're guilty of it. You know, stuff like that. You know, you're, you, just because you consent to it, you're you're a partaker you're guilty of association so this is why you got to be very careful with whom and what you follow on earth because it can mislead you and put you down the wrong path and i don't know if your name's been is it is in the book of life if it can cause you to lose that i guess it depends upon how far you go with it and to the point where you, you know, go wholeheartedly against God and want him out of your life completely, he may just leave and take this, take the Holy Spirit with him. Because we even, you know, see this in one of those up, coming up where it talks about stuff like that. So anyways, let's continue on. Uh, verse 19. Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in a piece. I'll tear you, yeah, tear you in pieces. And there be none to deliver. And so, a lot of people think, well, God's not punishing me for doing this, so I guess it's okay. It's like, he, he may be, you know, he... He kept silent about it. He's waiting for you to course correct yourself. And it says, forget not that he can tear you to pieces. Like the, like the other part of the Bible says, what well, Jesus says, do not fear those who can kill the body. Fear those, fear the one that can kill the soul and body. Uh, verse 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. 
chapter 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Not to say that this one spoke whole, totally to me today, because... I didn't feel good. I had, I did yard, yard work today. It's supposed to have been cooler and cloudy and yeah, nicer weather, and it wasn't. It came out humid, bright and sunny, and felt miserable. <laughs> and things kept going wrong. And yeah, I wasn't a happy camper today and said a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have said. And so this happens. Like the one thing I notice when I'm getting older is. I don't handle stress as well as I used to. So that's the thing I always ask for people, hey, help pray for me on this so I get better at it. But you got to remember, we're not going to be perfect. We're going to fail a lot. But it's what you're trying to be versus, you know, what happens. And so I was just, I was out of my normal being today. I was wrong in so many ways, but yeah. This one spoke heavily to me today because of just how my day went until I could get done with stuff and get things taken care of. And once I got all cooled down, showered up and whatever else and calmed down, then it hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, how I actually acted today. And of course, I was praying for forgiveness a lot on that one because I knew I was wrong, but... Yeah, thank God we're not called to be perfect. We are to try, but we're, God knows we're not going to be perfect, and God's word is to show us where we fall short at. But, yeah, anyways, continue on, verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was... Uh, shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me now of course that's mean we're all born sinners you know we were raised in iniquities a lot of us were I don't know of anybody who was raised in a truly godly home and godly environment and godly society to where they've never seen evil or you know had to deal with stuff like that and manipulation and deceit and abuse and, and all this other stuff it's kind of what that mean what that uh, what that is meaning there I'm trying to speak a little slower so my dyslexia don't come in and beat me up uh, verse 6 behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom and that's what God's word does it brings us more wisdom that's why we study it. Verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from, from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, okay, now that's a very close thing to pay attention to. A lot of people I've heard today, well, I'm going to say a lot, but I have heard it a lot, that you can't lose your salvation. Old Testament and New Testament speaks of people losing the Holy Spirit. And here's clearly King David saying this. So the Holy Spirit did exist in Old Testament times as well. But it was they were sanctified under the law instead of grace. Only very special people got the Holy Spirit. Now, for you to be saved and to get into heaven, you must have the Holy Spirit. But here it even says the Holy Spirit can be taken away. And if the Holy Spirit's taken away, then that means your name has been blotted out of the book of life. It's not in there. 
And from my understanding, you can get it back. Um, but you have to... You have to do some really, really horrible stuff, I feel, to lose the Holy Spirit. And the one is, if you do wrong and you don't feel bad for it, chances are you've lost it or you never had it to begin with. So, um, But the Bible speaks of these things, so I'm going to trust God's word over someone, a human being's speakings. So... Uh, you can do what you want to do, but I said, I will always choose God's word and what it says over anybody on earth and what they say. Let's continue on verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And that's what we're doing here is spreading the gospel. So if you don't know God and you're still part of the world, that's why we do this because we're commanded to. All Christians are commanded to do this very thing is to spread the gospel and help educate transgressors, people that don't know that, hey, there is a better way. There is freedom from sin. And a lot of people don't even know that they're sinners. They don't understand it. So we're to educate on that as well. That only all it takes is one sin to keep you out of heaven. And most people have done that, you know, by, by the age of uh, accountability and then afterwards. But anyways, let's continue on 14. Deliver, deliver me from blood guiltiness. I had to look that one up too. That means to have committed murder or uh, shed blood, which King David did. And the reason why he couldn't build the temples because he had shed blood. He was a warrior. He's killed thousands of people in battle. And he's also committed murder. Now, I don't know if this psalm was written before or after. Because he didn't actually commit murder himself, but he had uh, Bathsheba's husband killed so that he can try to hide his sin of his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. But God says that's murder because he made it happen. He gave the order and commandment to, hey, take him into heart, the, the strongest battle area and then retreat from him, leaving him there to be killed. That was in the, in the paperwork that he actually gave the man. The man came back. King David called him back to him and everything else, trying to get him, because you know, he found out Bathsheba was pregnant from the adulterous affair, so he brought her husband back hoping that he would go and then sleep with his wife, then thinking that the child would be his, but he refused to do so because his people, his soldiers, could not be with their wives, so he refused to be with his wife because honoring his soldiers. So he's a very honor it was a very honorable man and also a friend of King David. And so since he wouldn't go be with his wife, King David then says, Well, he must die, you know, that's that's you know, when somebody's in sin and stuff deep. They don't think straight. So he actually gave him a scroll, when a paper, whatever he was using him as uh, the, uh, uh, the messenger, and he carried his own death note to the leader above him. So when he got there, he said, here's this. And all of a sudden they opened it red and goes, okay, he clearly didn't read it because it called for, for him to die. And he delivered it, you know, that's how cold King David was about it at that time. He was trying to cover up his sin with the people, forgetting that, you know, I guess, for, you know, he forgot that God knows exactly what he did. But anyway, but yeah, so the blood guiltiness, as I said, I don't know when this psalm was written before or after that, but still he's already shed blood. And so anyways, let's continue on. I'm going to restart that 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. 
thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thy mouth, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Of course, to have a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart means that internally you are done and you call upon God to fix you, which a lot of us do deal a lot with stress and stuff like that today loneliness and everything else and we kind of stay broken we're not full of ourselves we know we're broken and we know we're unworthy and that's what God wants to see is people humbled and knowledge of knowing that we can't make it without him Anyways, verse 18 do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And the last chapter, this is a short one, so it's only nine verses. This, is, this would go to politicians a lot today I would feel uh, and a lot of people in our judicial systems all around the world not just America said this wickedness is spreading big time but you got to remember the end times people will call wicked good and good wicked and they will be lovers of themselves so that's one of the things we're saying Look up when these things are happening, for the end is nigh. Okay, so chapter 52. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Sila. Now, of course, I myself, I consider myself a Christian constitutionalist. So I know plenty of Republicans that lie to get into office with deceit. And I know a buttload of Democrats that do it. Almost every single one of them that I've ever heard speak do this they love evil more than good and lying rather than speak righteousness Biden's a big time in it he thinks he has to have a bigger better story so he seems better than the other man so he gets elected and it's worked for him for over 50 something years in office people buy in to the words instead of paying attention to the person so for some people, they chose to be deceived. They enjoy it. And for others that don't know any better, you, you were deceived, so you're kind of innocent in that. But some people are not innocent in it because they know it's a lie and they don't care. Anyways, let's go on. Verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. And of course, this is why, you know, like I worry about Jimmy Carter. I just saw something posted about him saying that, you know, he hopes he lives, lives to be 100 so he can still vote Democrat. I'm sitting there like, when you see all the evil that's going on from politician stuff today and you still want to vote for that, it's like, I truly feel that that man is not saved and not ready to meet God. 
And the sad fact is he probably thinks he is. For me, sometimes I think some people live a very long life because God's saying, I'm giving you every chance to get right. And I can only hold back death for so long. That's uh but some people live a long life that are godly and holy and have the Holy Spirit and saved. But they also live it. Jimmy Carter, he was like uh, one of the first worst presidents we had when it come to the economy. And Biden somehow managed to do worse than him. I was a kid watching Jimmy Carter and stuff. I was a child. I had no clue about politics. I didn't know how bad it was or anything else. I was just a little kid living in trailer parks. You know, living in the trailer park and stuff. But I heard my dad say a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, bad words when he was speaking on, his, on the television when he'd have his little speeches. But yeah, anyways. My dad knew a lot more than me. Cause, of course, I was a child. He was an adult. But now I'm the adult. Uh, my dad's passed away, but either or. It's like uh, when you become an adult and you start learning the truth, it's like, wow. And people bought into the lies so he can get elected. Man. Anyways, let's continue on. Verse 6. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength. Now, of course, Biden claims to be Christian, claims to go to Catholic churches, this, that, and the other stuff. And we've known from teachings that just because someone said it best. Um, I'm trying to remember how they worded it. They said, we got a lot of churchgoers in America today that, uh, what do they say, that they're, they're they're not, they're they're announced Christians or they say they're Christians. They go to church and call themselves Christian, but they're not. And got got a lot of people recognizing that we have very few true Christians in America today. And got a lot of people going to churches. Like I'm sorry, I, I live in Tennessee, and one of my politicians is Marsha Blackburn. I'm going to pick on her today. She claims to be Christian, but she is a woman. And she's a politician, which gives her authority over men. So her desire... Now, she also went to college. So, and God... The book says a woman is not to receive an education. She's to be taught, taught by her husband what he needs her to know so she's a better assistant for him because woman was created to be her husband's helpmate. That's the reason for the woman's existence. She has a very, very important role in society, but when women don't obey their role in society, society falls apart. Same thing as men, but women have a very crucial role in society of, you know, obeying God. Now, this woman claims to be Christian, but her entire career, she has a career and everything else in her whole life goes against God's commandments. So I have to say that she does not have the Holy Spirit, but she thinks she does. Just because she calls herself something, she thinks that that makes it so. But since she's not listening to the Holy Spirit telling her she's living wrong because she doesn't have the Holy Spirit, she thinks that she's okay. And a lot of people live this way. Make no mistake, if you're a woman, you have guidelines on how you are to be. And you were created a very crucial, crucial role in supporting the man. Because if the man has no guidance in life, you know, nothing to work towards, he gets lost. He can serve God and have the Holy Spirit and be a Christian, but... There's nothing to work for when he can't have a family. And if home becomes strife, there's no reason to go home. 
because it isn't a home. It's just a house. It's just a place. A woman's respond. You know, a woman's responsible for obeying God's word because she can. She makes a house into a home. But you know, stuff like that. But either or. Um. A lot of people they call themselves godly, but they don't make. They don't obey God. And that's what's, you know, stuff like this is, uh, well, let's, let's reread seven. It makes a lot more sense when you start realizing all these people claim to be Christian, especially women, wanting to be a politician, a judge, a police officer, soldiers, blah, 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 all this other stuff. And like, it, women are not even supposed to be able to vote. A Christian woman shouldn't vote because she's now putting her voice having a th to have authority over a man it goes against God's teachings and you have other women out there today coming out uh, you know God speaking to them as well saying hey help teach people they're doing wrong and they're starting to see the downfall of society and realize where it's coming from and so they're trying to in their own sense trying to help I think God's working through them on that but you know if society doesn't listen, then, you know, your society. Uh, I just kind of posted a little meme, I guess would say. But I said, said, if Jesus is not the leader over your life, your family's life, and your society, then Satan is. And that's a fact. If Jesus is not leading you, then Satan is. But. And that's what these people do. It's like, you know, they think God's word does not apply to them because God is silent in what they're doing. But remember, God says, you know, he'll still rip them apart, especially when they use God's, when they mock God. When you say that you're a Christian, but you live a wicked life and do wickedness, you go outside of God's word, help and mislead other people, that angers God a lot. That's mocking him. You know, that's, uh, that's in a sense, that's a form of mocking him. And God really hates that. But anyways, let's continue on here because I just looked. I'm over 45, over in the 40-minute range. Way over time, but huh, that's kind of my thing, I guess. <laughs> I don't mean to, but when things need to be taught or talked about then I just then I do I don't really care about the time then but so sorry about that let's go ahead and finish this because it's where I hear at the end so verse 7 again lo this is a man that made not God his strength he trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait on the name. I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. Now, of course, that ending part, you know, eight, eight and nine, that's how we are to live. And of course, we're going to fail at that because even today I was not waiting on the Lord. I was angry at everything because I was frustrated and I don't know what it is. I just don't handle frustrations at good at all no more. I just lose my crapola so easily sometimes. And I know what it is. I just don't know how to fix it because I live in pain with these injuries from the military. And... So I'm always on edge, and it doesn't take much to just push me on over. But I'm one of those people that couldn't find a good woman or dealt with a lot of deceitful, lying women. So I have a house. I don't have a home. I never got to have any children, so I have no help in life. And so please pray for me on that. I need, uh, we all need help in life because we can't do everything ourselves unless we have the money to hire people to do things. 
which I don't have either. Yeah. But it is what it is. So that's the end of the lesson. Like I always say, remember to pray. Pray for me, I'll pray for you. I need it, you need it. Uh, and we also need to pray, keep talking to God. Because he's a very just God. He's a very merciful God. And he understands life is crap. He understands You know, that we lose our cool during the day and say things we don't mean. He doesn't like us for doing it. It's not an okay to do so, but the Bible specifically mentions it in a way that it's going to happen. And our thing is to remember that we're wrong when we do it and to try to be better. But I'm going to go ahead and end this lesson here. So until next time, God bless, good night, and goodbye.